Okay, so we're going to have a look at the uh, nucleophilic addition reaction of hydrogen cyanide uh, to a carbonyl compound. So the first thing that um, I suppose you need to be aware of here, guys, is that this is common to both aldehydes and ketones. So you just change the R group on the aldehyde and the ketone. You learn the general mechanism that we're going to look at. So the nucleophile is the hydrogen, or sorry, the cyanide ion from the hydrogen cyanide. And if we just just be careful here when you are doing your mechanism that you show the lone pair on the carbon. Very often we have lone pairs uh, on nitrogen and then students get a bit confused thinking that the lone pair has to be on the nitrogen for a, a change here it is on the uh, actually on the carbon and it is this nucleophile that attacks because we have this polar bond in the aldehyde or ketone because we've got this very electronegative oxygen and it attacks the delta positive carbon in that particular bond and that's what causes the reaction to to initiate. Sometimes you're asked to draw all of the dot cross diagram for the cyanide ion. I'll just do that for you. If you remember that uh, the this is a negative ion, the cyanide is negative so it's got an electron from elsewhere, from the hydrogen of course in this instance. So the carbon still has four electrons in its outer shell, okay? plus this one that has come from the hydrogen. And remember, nitrogen needs three bonds to gain a full outer shell. So it has a lone pair left on it. So therefore, we get the bonding or the dot cross diagram like that. And normally, we'd put that in square brackets and put a negative charge up in the top right-hand corner. And you see I've used three different symbols for the electron just to show that one has come from elsewhere. OK, so the general reaction for this uh, very simple, okay. If we uh, okay, so our aldehyde or our ketone reacts with the hydrogen cyanide, and we get a product which is called a hydroxy nitrate. Okay, and you can see that on the on the screen there now. And for our hydroxy nitrile, okay, the reason why it's called a hydroxy nitrile is we've two. Obviously, we've got two functional groups. Uh, one of them is a nitrile functional group. One of them is an alcohol functional group. That one there, the alcohol functional group in this instance is the lower priority functional group. And when alcohols are lower priority, if you remember back to AAS1, they're called hydroxy groups. The reason why it's called a two hydroxy nitrile is because you will find that your carbon. Uh, here for your nitrile group is position number one. So the hydroxy group is always on the second carbon along, or in other words, on position number two here. Okay. So let's have a look at how this. So we get two hydroxy nitriles. Now, the reaction is, uh, is actually speeded up by using, as you can see on the board here, potassium cyanide. Okay, mixed with uh, some dilute sulfuric acid. And you might think, well, why not just use hydrogen cyanide? Well, hydrogen cyanide is, is here. It is a reactant, but it's an extremely weak acid. So it only very, very partially ionizes. So we need hydrogen ions and cyanide ions both for this reaction to occur. If we're relying on hydrogen cyanide as a source of those, unfortunately, there is very, very few of those. Okay. And that means that the reaction ends up being far too slow. So you might say, well, then why do we use potassium cyanide? Well, potassium cyanide is an ionic salt of hydrogen cyanide. It is a salt which will 100% ionize. Okay, So you will get lots of cyanide ions here. Okay, The potassium ion is extremely stable, so all it does is act as a spectator ion. It doesn't actually get involved in the chemistry of the reaction. Similar reason for using sulfuric acid. Again, if we go up to here, because hydrogen cyanide only partially ionizes, the hydrogen ion uh, a concentration from that ionization is, is tiny. So we use sulfuric acid, which as we know, hopefully, is a strong acid. gives me loads of hydrogen ions. And again, uh, so that'll speed the reaction up and the sulfate ion down here, similar to the potassium ion above, is a ion which is very stable and just acts as a spectator ion. So it doesn't get involved in the 
and the chemistry of the the reaction okay right so if I just clear that so what I want you to do is just take a take a second and to have a go at working out what would the products be predict the products of hydrogen cyanide with the three uh, I can do one, two, and three. You should be able to do one, two, and three, okay. Um, and if you uh, if you can do four, all uh, all the better. But you're probably a little bit beyond you just at the minute. So pause the video, have a go at those, and then I'll put them on. Okay. So those are your answers. I mean, all you were really doing here was you were taking the methanol, okay. So if we took methanol as C double O hydrogen there, hydrogen there. And then all you had to do was follow the, the reaction from previous, break the double bond to a single bond. That becomes an OH and put your CN on there. Okay. The thing that will catch people out is we're starting off with methanol, but now we've two carbons in our compound. So we go to an ethan nitride, a two-hydroxy ethan nitride. Likewise here we have propanone. So we start off with propanone. Okay, again, we break the double bond, that goes there. Then we have this, our cyan, our nitrile here. Uh, but this time, through our longest chain, is three, so like so. So this time we have a methyl group. So we still have a propan nitrile, but we also have to account for the extra carbon uh, to as a, a methyl group, sorry. <coughs> Ethan, ethanol, sorry. So ethanol, obviously, as so. Again break the double bond, H goes to there, and our CN goes to there, and now this time we do have to elongate the carbon chain as so. Okay, so just be careful of that, that you don't get caught out by the extra carbon that you will have, whether it be in a methyl group or whether it be uh, as part of your, your longest chain, okay? Right, let's have a look then at the mechanism for this. So again, mechanism, we're thinking, guys, a... Uh, which are relevant dipoles, where are my lone pairs of electrons, where are my curly arrows, so just remind yourself that curly arrows go from where the pair of electrons start to where they uh, are attracted or where they are moving towards. So if you maybe have a think about where the pair of, or where the curly arrow would go in this context, so yes of course it goes from there to my delta positive carbon which means that my carbon here will have five pairs of electrons around it currently so one of the pairs of electrons in the double bond gets pushed off the carbon okay and then from there we go to the next stage okay so there's my curly arrows next stage then you can see my oxygen now has got uh, the lone pair of electrons located completely on it here. It has gone from being delta negative where it had a, it had a share of these electrons to being completely negative ion. That's important because it's got those electrons now completely localized on that carbon. The double One of the bonds in the double bond has broken, of course. Okay. Then our sulfuric acid comes into play where we get our protonation. Okay. So remember a lot of times what we'll see here is the curly arrow going the wrong way because people think oh the hydrogen is attacking the uh, oxygen which is fair enough or the oxide which is fair enough but remember curly arrow shows the movement of a pair of electrons from where it starts to where it's going to so it has to go in that direction. And then finally we have our final product. Okay, so all you'll do, whatever your aldehyde or ketone is, in all instances there, guys, you'll just, if it was, for example, propanol, you're just simply copying across your CH3s in all times, or it doesn't matter what they are, you just focus your efforts around the functional group. If you know your mechanism well enough, you'll be fine from that perspective. Okay, so there's a few of those in your notes you can have a, have a go at. Um, and just double check them. Or so, you also need to know then why is it that whenever we get an aldehyde uh, or a ketone in this reaction mixture, uh, and one in which, this is also important, one in which that R1 and R2 are different, why do we always get a racemic mixture? Just remember what 
a your racemic mixture is it's when we get a a product sorry in which we have four different groups around the carbon so why is it if we have a compound here uh, an aldehyde or ketone that we start off with is we do we always get a racemic mixture and remember a racemic mixture will give us a 50 50 mix of this product which even though each individual isomer will be able to rotate the plane of plane polarized light the mixture itself won't because the mixtures you remember from when we did isomers will cancel out the rotation of plane polarized light okay well let's have a look well the reason why we get this racemic mixture is because all aldehydes and ketones around the functional group okay which is this one are trigonal planar if you apply your valence shell electron per repulsion theory from AS2 chemistry you'll see that they are all uh, this is a trigonal planar molecule so what is the chances of my cyanide ion attacking from if you like above the plane or attacking from below the plane in the first step of the mechanism well of course they're 50 50 mix or from the front and the back above and below doesn't matter okay um so there is an equal chance of that happening the next attack in this mechanism then is the hydrogen well if this cyanide ion has a 50 percent chance of attacking from above well then the hydrogen ion will have a 50 percent chance of coming in from uh, from there from that direction from below and likewise if the cyanide ion attacks from this direction then the hydrogen ion will have to attack from above so either way you're going to get a 50 50 mix of the cyanide ion having attacked from above and the hydrogen ion from below or alternatively the cyanide ion attacking from below here and then the hydrogen ion attacking from above and that will leave you with a 50 50 mix of both of your two potential optical isomers which means that because you've got a 50 50 mix while each isomer is an optical isomer they will be unable to rotate the plane of plane polarized light and therefore we have what's called a racemic or a, a racemic mixture or a racemate okay i will leave it there guys and um, that hopefully is the mechanism cleared up you can see from your powerpoint you have um just flicking through them there you have still got a few questions which you can have a go at they're all uh, they're also in the past paper questions okay and if you can do those get them done get them checked and that should uh, allow you to have a pretty good understanding of this mechanism